Hi, I wanted to come on today and talk about my experience with eustachian tube dysfunction. I want to talk about uh, my timelines, my symptoms, and the treatments that I've sought. So a lot of people have eustachian tube dysfunction for a myriad of reasons, but for me, it was muscular. And here's my story. So one day I woke up on a Monday morning in July and it's currently December. So I woke up in July and I was clenching. I had a nightmare. My jaw was tight. My face was tight. My ears were congested. I freaked out because I also felt dizzy. Um, hearing was kind of off and um, noises were muffled and I felt very disoriented. I felt like I had a little bit of vertigo, but not in the sense where the room was spinning or anything like that, but just in terms of um, just feeling dizzy, a little bit off, almost like I was drugged, if you will, just a little bit off. Um, I thought I had some weird allergy reaction or something like that. I took antihistamines, I took pseudofedrin, and this happened on a Monday. And by Wednesday, it started to resolve. The hearing distortion went away. And let me say a little bit about uh, the hearing distortion. Anything that was low in terms of a rumble, like from a truck or a bus or my AC or the bass from the TV, it would just um, would feel very different in my in my ears, almost like there was uh, too much noise coming in. I believe they call that hyperkosis when you're sensitive to sound, and it's not that I couldn't listen to um, loud noises. It was that the bass would not register right. Um, so by the Wednesday of that week, after being on pseudofedrin and an antihistamine, it started to resolve. And by the Friday, it was like it never happened. And I thought that I was done with the story. So about three weeks later, on uh, I think it was August 21st, I woke up, no nightmare, but I had the exact same symptoms again. So I did the same thing I did before. I took some antihistamine, pseudofedrin, and this time it was a Sunday, and by the Tuesday, Wednesday, I thought it should be gone, and it was not. So that's when I decided to seek um, a GP out and talk about my symptoms, and they went through the usual line. They asked me if I had any infections, they asked me if I had any allergies, they asked me if I had a history of this before, they asked me if I had TMJD, and the answer was no. Um, nevertheless, um, because it was a virtual doctor, they didn't have a chance to look in my ear. They prescribed um, a prescription antihistamine at that point. Um, so I believe that was uh, Blackston at the time. So I took the Blackston and maybe about a week went by and nothing happened. Um, by that time, I was getting very desperate. It was very uncomfortable um, having all that pressure. felt like my head was going to explode. It was really severe. Um, so I went to Emerge, I told them what was going on, and they said, well, you know what, there, we can't see anything in your ear, you don't have any infection that we can visibly see, no fluid. Uh, they changed the uh, antihistamine to Rupatidine, I believe, at the time. They asked me to go on a corticosteroid, and they explained the corticosteroid, you're supposed to put it in your nose, and it's supposed to like angle and drip into your eustachian <laughs> tube, because your eustachian tube has the same lining as your as your your, your um, lining of your, your nasal cavity. And my logic was like, why would I do that? Just trying to accidentally get it in there because it's, there was no guarantee and the literature on, on it says that um, it's about 50-50 whether any sort of nasal corticosteroids would actually make themselves into the ear. So I said, give me prednisone. So they put me on 30, 30 mils of prednisone for one week. And after doing that, it it, it didn't seem to resolve whatsoever. It was still the same constant pressure. Um, the prednisone again was just a short treatment. Uh, it was only for five days and they wanted me to get on that corticosteroid. So they gave me um, a prescription for Avamis and Avamis is supposed to work on your nasal symptoms, your allergy symptoms and the symptoms of your eye if you have any um, allergic uh, eye issues. So I, on the third day of being on the antihistamine, the prednisone, I took the corticosteroid and I woke up to 
my eyeball feeling like it was on fire. It was dry. It was burning. This was within two hours. And uh, I woke up with blurred vision, could not see. And I also don't have any sort of vision problems whatsoever. So this was concerning, as you can imagine. So I rushed myself off to the ER, get a CT scan. Um, and they say, you know, there's no bleeds. There's nothing, you know, going on with your brain or anything like that. I had a full ophthalmological ophthalmological exam and um, they dilated my eyes and they they looked in and they said you know what you don't have any sort of issues with your eyes and they they didn't really understand what happened i personally believe the antihistamines plus the pseudoephedrine plus the the nasal corticosteroid plus the prednisone that was probably way too much for my body to to take at the time so it resulted in that in, in that uh, eye symptom nevertheless i still have the primary culprit, which is the congestion in the ears. So about uh, the week before Labor Day, I was playing with my my muscle back here. And as I pressed it, I could feel that um, crunchy noise in my eustachian tube. So it occurred to me that this could be muscular. I mean, at that point, I had been on uh, allergy medications for about three weeks and uh, nothing happened. And the prednisone was in me. If there was an inflammation there, the prednisone would have surely kicked it out and there was nothing there. So I decided to go on about 1600 uh, milligrams of uh, magnesium biglycinate. And when I did that, this ear felt much better. And um, it wasn't completely resolved, but about 90% it was, it was uh, resolved. And this ear was still spasm, like I could feel the spasm in the ear. So I'm like, okay, this is muscular. So I did get a, a referral for the ENT. And I believe it was around September 15th that week that I saw an ENT and they scoped me and they said, you know, everything with your anatomy of your ear is fine. Um, I had at that point also done three hearing tests. And so my eustachian tubes were open as far as they could see. Air was passing through as far as they can see. But nevertheless, I had this tightness and pressure that was unrelenting, but for the the uh, magnesium that seemed to loosen things up a bit. So the ENT actually bought into it being a, um, a muscular issue and he prescribed uh, an intraoral massage. So for those who don't know what an intraoral massage is, they go into your mouth, they massage the, the masseter muscle, the temporalis, there's some muscles here underneath the underneath the neck, and they go in there and they, they break it down. Now this technique is used for people who suffer from TMJ uh, D, um, where they have um, a lot of tightness because they brooks and their joints are tight and their muscles are tight. And so they break it down so that they can stop firing. So if the muscle is contracting and it, it does this, um, they make it so it stays flat. So I went in and saw um, a clinic for the central or massage the week of, I think it was September 25th. And they prescribed uh, treatment two times a week 15 minutes each treatment with a day between. And then after treatment, I would have to ice. So after the first and second treatment, I actually felt a lot of air passage through my eustachian tubes, which is a very weird thing to say because eustachian tubes are flat and they only open to release pressure or fluid. But it felt like there was just this sensation of air and, and, and clarity, just movement in this area. It was absolutely fantastic, actually. Um, but unfortunately, I started to develop some symptoms from the intramural massage. By the fourth week, um, or actually, sorry, by the fourth treatment, which would have been the second week, I noticed that my top row of my teeth were getting numb. I was having paresthesia sensations on the side of my face. And I was also getting joint discomfort and issues um, on a side where I've never experienced any sort of joint issues. I do have um, some sort of disc sensitivity. If I try to open really wide and bite down, I'll feel a little pain. And I've had this for over a decade, but it's never been anything that my dentist was concerned about or anything like that. And by the way, I did see an allergist and I also did see my dentist before I had seen the ENT and they both 
weren't able to explain what was going on. Um, the dentist didn't see any signs of bruxism, any wear, any need for a, uh, a bite guard or any sort of appliance, nothing. And the allergist said, well, hey, you have allergies uh, that are seasonal. Maybe this is your body, you know, uh, overreacting. And that turned out not to be the case when I went to the ENT. Like I said, they didn't see anything. So I did see those um, practitioners as well. So back to the intraoral massage. So I started to develop um, numbness in my upper row of teeth. When I would eat, I would feel it on my lower row of teeth as well. I got paresthesia on my face. So when I would touch my skin, it felt very sensitive, very not my skin. And this was very concerning. So I started to get relief from the ear congestion, but I was developing these other symptoms. Now, uh, the clinic said that this was normal and uh, that, it, you know, you kind of have to get worse before you get better. Didn't really like that answer, but that's what they said. So I was almost toward the end of the four weeks. So at that point, it would have been the eight treatments. And I said, time out. We need to stop. What I was also getting was tinnitus. And so that is a horrible symptom. If you don't know what tinnitus is, it's ringing in the ear. So I would get a high pitch noise in this ear, a low groan in this ear. And after the treatments, I would usually swell up a little bit and the tinnitus would get worse. So now I have tinnitus, I have numb teeth, and I have paresthesia of the face, and then I get a joint pain here that I never had before. And this is all in addition to the uh, ear congestion. So uh, I stopped treatment. Right now, it's been six weeks removed from treatment, and the air congestion is still present. It's intermittent now. Um, what I was getting maybe about a week after stopping treatment was at the jaw. I guess the muscles wanted to go back to where they were. So as I explained before, they stopped them from contracting. Now they contracted, and so it went into spasm. So I would get these nasty Charlie horses is what I'm going to call it. That's what it felt like in my face. It would clench down, and then it would cascade the symptoms. Uh, so I would get the full ear congestion plus the tinnitus plus the hearing distortion and there's muscles in your middle ear. So what was happening where I explained earlier that the sound was distorted. There's muscles that are in your inner ear that are used to dampen sound and those are going into spasm as well. So my, <laughs> my whole face was messed up to say the least. Um, the spasms would come on every every couple of days, literally every two days. I would try to figure out what made them worse. Talking made it worse. Eating made it worse. Um, my diet throughout this entire time has been soft foods. I, I couldn't even chew uh, a sausage. Like the casing of the sausage was too much for me to, to grind down. So I was having eggs and a little bit of soft fruit um, in this time. And that would just fatigue my face and I would go into spasm. The other practitioners that I was looking at um, were osteopaths and physiotherapists and chiropractors because apparently there's a lot of connectivity between your joints of your of your jaw and your eustachian tubes and uh, to your neck. So your SCMs, your suboccipital muscles, um, your traps. And so I was seeing those practitioners to see if I could get some relief there. Uh, all of them said that I was tight. I don't think that was unusual. I'm usually holding a lot of tension up in my shoulders on a good day. Um, so I don't know. They tried to, to massage it out and work out knots and trigger points that they would find, but nothing has helped so far. So um, in the last week, I've seen a neuromuscular dentist and to see if there is anything with my bite that is causing all of this pressure and the spasms. Um, so the dentist didn't really see too much. He didn't see that I was uh, a brookser and that I was clenching and that there was undue pressure here. But they did recommend that maybe I sit on the TENS machine to re relax the muscles, seeing how the intraoral massage worked. But it was obviously too aggressive. And then they would see where my jaw wants to be. Sorry, I uh, 
needed to get space on my phone. So as I was saying, I went in and saw a neuromuscular dentist to see if there was any pressure being exerted by my bite. Um, earlier on, I told you that I did see a dentist, but it was a regular dentist, so they couldn't really see anything. They checked the bite by putting um, that blue paper in and you bite down and they see if your bite is okay. Neuromuscular dentists do um, a completely different diagnostic by virtue of a machine that they put into your mouth and they actually can digitally see the the pressure points that you're exerting through your bite. So with that appointment, they did not determine that I had anything really unusual, maybe a little bit of pressure in the front teeth, but nothing in the back here that would indicate that I am bruxing, clenching, biting down, wearing my teeth. Um, but what they did recommend is that I could use their TENS machine to see if that would help relieve the symptoms. Now, a TENS machine is a facial TENS machine. They use it in their practice to relax those who are clenching so that they can get um, a proper fit for an appliance. So they get the muscles relaxed and they have you bite and then you could see where your teeth need to be. So I would not need to go the appliance route hopefully, um, because I didn't see anything really there. Uh, but maybe the use of the facial tens machine would relax the jaw muscles. And that is to say, if the intraoral massage did work, but it was made, obviously, not maybe, it was too aggressive for my face, then maybe the tens machine would work. That treatment, though, is very expensive. And so... And it's unsustainable. Like, so for instance, I would go in today and I would sit on it for an hour, but what if I'm tight in two days? Am I gonna go back to the dentist and, and, and get the machine again, the use of the machine again? That wouldn't make any sense. So um, if that was a plausible route, I think I would look into purchasing uh, that machine for at-home use. Uh, the other thing I'm gonna look into is a concussion clinic. So the, at the concussion clinic, they see clients that have obviously concussions and also whiplash victims. Whiplash victims, concussion victims, they have changes in their bite, pain in their jaw, uh, ear fullness, and tinnitus. And so those um, specialists are kinesiologists and physiotherapists, and they understand all of the interconnectivity which is going on between the jaw, the neck, the, the muscles of the trap, the shoulders, everything and all the nerves. So I am looking forward to doing that. So right now, I believe it's December 7th today, December 7th, December 8th. And I am talking, but I'm very fatigued. So what I'm going to do and what I've been doing, um, I don't have it in front of me, but I've been getting a uh, use of this heating pad. I've been using a heating pad to just warm up my face and do some exercises. So in addition to the intraoral massage, I've been doing some self massage to my masseter, um, so I'll, I'll demonstrate it very lightly here, but um, biting down and pulling and pushing up and um, a lateral, pterygo lateral pterygoid release. So you put your finger up into your mouth and you press down. Um, I'm not explaining it properly, but it's not something you should do if you're not familiar with it. So if you're interested, I'll link, I'll, I'll have links to um, those techniques that I found online and a lot of uh, temporalis massages and the SCM and the trigger points. So I've been doing those things. So um, I'm still getting the air congestion. I'm still getting the spasms that are happening uh, every couple of days. It's not been a great journey, um, but I thought, you know, when I looked on YouTube at the very beginning, there was a lot of, of stuff about a eustachian tube dysfunction, but not a lot about it being a muscular issue. And especially the way I experienced it, the fullness and the congestion in my ear, everybody's going to an ENT, allergist, taking lots of medication. And it's all about the way the muscles of the face are being used and your muscles of your neck. Um, so I will continue to update you guys, but I just wanted to add to this that yes, you could have eustachian tube dysfunction. It can be muscular. In my case, it is muscular. How I got here, why I got here, <laughs> I don't know what the original sin was, um, but uh, I am trying to fix it. All right, if you have any questions, leave some comments and I will answer them. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day.